David, we should have stand still on some of our major highways. We'll have a lot of hazardous waste for the whole of right? So, why are we here? What's our purpose? How do we fit into this great cosmic scheme that is the universe? I've got a very simple answer. We're here to eat. <laughs> Gastronomy and all that it encompasses, I feel is the most important and integral thing in the universe. It binds us together. Food is wonderful. You can't be mad at someone when you're eating a great dinner. My universe, my mind's eye, it's an ever-deepening gastronomic rabbit hole. I am continually exploring and dissecting food. I'm trying to figure out how to best enjoy it, push its limits, see what else it can be. Food takes many forms. Here's some of the wild foods we use at Trentina. One of the things that I love are fungi, and that's primarily what I'm going to discuss today. And fungi come in all shapes and forms. Here's a few of my favorite. Fungi are incredible organisms, and they work in ways that we can't even imagine. And when it comes to food, they can do more for us than just look pretty on a plate. I have this obsession with fungi, and it goes back to my love of them as an ingredient and a food stuff. I'm so obsessed with them that my daughter's middle name is Morcella, which is the Latin name for a morel mushroom. <laughs> it's one of her middle names. This obsession with fungi has pushed me to explore other types of fungi, and specifically molds. There's a mold that comes from southeastern Asia. It's been domesticated for about 2,500 years, and it's called koji. It's Aspergillus oryzae. Koji is really, really awesome. It's really unique, and it's responsible for a lot of foods that we take for granted. We don't necessarily understand how they're made things like sake, things like miso. These foods have to, have to use this, this mold here to become what they are. So I work at this restaurant, Trentina. I do a lot of things. I came back to Cleveland, working here, working with Chef Jonathan Sawyer, running our larder. I started exploring. We started building up our program of wild foods. We have this awesome pasta program and we have the larder. And it is a magical place. This is where food gets transformed into a myriad of ingredients. I can start with something as simple as an apple peel and turn it into, God knows what, a vapor, a salt, a pickle. And we do perform magic spells in the larder. Many, many different types of ferments and preserved foods are there. But what really intrigues us about these ferments is not necessarily what they, what they turn into and how they appear on a plate. We like the idea that they are living. They're living ferments. They're growing, they're, trans, they're, they're morphing all the time. They're alive. We make all different sorts of things. Autolyzed extracts of razor clams. We grow salts, come up with new ways to make cheese. Over the winter, Chef Star and I were talking, and most of our conversations do look like this. Both of us are a little puzzled. Not really sure what's going on. And then it hits us. So we decided, Trentina being an Italian restaurant, that I would make a miso-like product using garbanzo beans. Soy really isn't uh, used in Italian cooking. So to make soy, I needed to obtain the spores of, of koji, of this Aspergillus fungi. Um, this fungi, it came to me in this little packet, ordered it from a company online little foil packet, all these green spores in it, and it came with these instructions on how to propagate and how to grow this mold. And I was really intrigued by this. It was laid out nice and neat in this packet, and I started to think to myself, why would this company that sells this to me tell me how to make it? Wouldn't they go out of business? Like, what's behind that? You know, I started doing more, more uh, research and invest investigation on how to grow ko koji, how to culture it. And I heard from various colleagues of mine. I did a lot of research at the Cleveland Public Library. I scanned every document that I could. And everything said that koji is an extremely laborious process to culture. You have to incubate it a specific way. 
You have to use a special type of rice to make it. You have to store it in these wooden boxes wrapped in cheesecloth. It has to be stirred every 20 minutes for four hours in a row. I'm thinking to myself, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm going to make something with this. This is what I'm going to do for 12 hours a day is just grow this. I'll never get to make miso. There's always another way. So in order to innovate, you have to be swift. You have to be creative. Nowadays, we live in a digital frontier. And if your innovation isn't swift, if it isn't creative, if it isn't captivating, and in relation to food, if it isn't delicious and makes someone salivate, then they're not going to want to experience it. So we have to go a step further with what we do. I decided, being a larder master and using all these food scraps, that I would come up with another way. And that's exactly what I did. So I noticed one day in the kitchen that our brodo was being made. And this is a fortified Italian-style vegetable stock. It's fortified with starch to give it a little bit of uh, a nicer mouth feel to it. And we use this rice. I decided I would strain it out, mix it with the koji spores. And the koji spores are also mixed with a, a little blend of semolina and rye flour just to help them attach to the rice. And I decided I'd take this spent, overcooked, mushy rice, the exact opposite of what everybody I knew and every book I said would, would make it grow. And I decided to grow it. So in the, my incubation chamber at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, this is what I got. This is koji. And mold is delicious, believe me. This mold specifically, one of the reasons it's believed that it was domesticated was because the aroma it puts off when it grows. Most of us, if we see mold in our refrigerator, it throws us off right away. So to talk about a mold and to think about a mold that smells so intoxicating you want to eat it, it's a little weird. It's a little weird for me even, and I thrive on this. So koji itself is very similar to other fungi. Um, Fungi go through a series of life phases as they're developing. To examine how to use koji, I had to do numerous things. See, I've always been the type of person that was a bit of a renegade. I thought my parents didn't know what's best for me. I thought our educational system was broken. I thought the government was unduly posing restrictions on our lives. I was always trying to be outside the box. And I got sober a number of years ago. And when I was being treated for drug and alcohol addiction, I came to this realization that I can't heal myself from the outside. I've got to reflect inward. I've got to see what's going on inside. I was able to apply that methodology to my life in general. And what happened was I realized that I had to be part of a system. I had to understand every single working part in order to understand how I could change it to suit my needs or the needs of others. I couldn't just stand there with a sign saying, this is broken, this is broken. I had to learn how it worked and then work it from the inside. So with fungi and their life cycle, this is really important to understanding what koji does and how it can work. They go through this wonderful life cycle where they release these spores. The spores float away onto a substrate they germinate, they turn into something called hyphae. The hyphae turns into mycelium, or the roots. And these, by the way, this is a wild strain of stropharia that I captured and we cultivate at Trentina in the grounds. All the wood chips around the restaurant are inoculated with it. So this mycelium then does a couple things. In a mushroom-type fungi, it turns into a mushroom, it fruits. In a mold, like koji, it produces these things called conidia. And these are little asexual packets of spores. And these spores, you can see here, you touch them and they just flutter away. So understanding this life cycle and how I could get koji to grow was really instrumental in to be able to create really cool food. And that's one thing that I'm really into. So a little bit more about the thought process behind this and how it can be applied. 
I constantly have to impose limits on myself to understand what I can do. So let's take the humble carrot. And I put humble in quotes, because carrots are anything but. If we look at the history of carrots, carrots come from Central Europe, the Mediterranean area. And at one time, they were all, you see this dark maroon here, maroon one here, they were all a purplish black color. Well, in the 15 and 1600s, the Dutch decided to pay an homage to the French royal court, and their color was orange. So the Dutch bred carrots to be orange. And the French were so enamored with this that their royal gardeners and their citizens bred carrots of all different shapes and sizes and colors. You know, from there, bring it up a little more present day, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and even today, the carrot was immortalized by Mel Blanc's Bugs Bunny. Bugs did all these wonderful, fun, he had these great escapades, these, these wonderful antics, and he was always eating a carrot. And from then on, we can look, carrots found their way into school lunches. They were there every day, and children associated the eating of carrots with having fun like a cartoon. And up to present day, we look at the carrot and we see what modern science has done with it. And it's dissected the carrot in a way where we understand how it's constructed, how it grows down to the molecular level. We can understand the individual atoms in it, how they react with each other, how they react on our tongue, how our tongue sends those signals to our brain. So, understanding all this is how I get to have fun with Koji. So I decided to start testing this. You know, as I stated before, traditional products made with koji are miso, sake, soy sauce. I wanted to do something completely different, something that hadn't been done before with koji. I didn't just want to make a sauce or an ingredient, I wanted to make a star. So I decided to establish a limit test. I'd been rummaging through the walk-in and, and seeing what I could do with koji. Earlier in that day, too, I'd been making some charcuterie. And if those are, aren't familiar with charcuterie, it's cured meat or seafood, and I guess we could lump cheeses into that, those categories. And I had this thought, like, the outside of a salami, a soprasetta, often has mold on it. Most cheeses are made with molds and have them on the outside. What if I could use koji as that mold, knowing what koji does? And when a fungus grows, it releases various enzymes onto the substrate it's growing on. These enzymes are amylases and proteases. And what they do is they break down starches and they break down proteins. So I'm in the walk-in and I see these scallops. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, so I have to incubate koji. I'm gonna put it on something that can spoil. You know, what if, what if I had scallops in my car for two days? What, on a hot summer day, like what's gonna happen? <laughs> I'm sure one or two of us in the audience have done that before. <laughs> so I decided that the scallops would be my limit test. Seafood uh, breaks down and, and can de deteriorate and rot much quicker than terrestrial proteins can, like beef or chicken, because of the way their muscle fibers are aligned. They're shorter, they're not as dense, and they're much more fragile. So I decided I would culture these scallops. So I took my spore mixture, and I thought, well, I can't just put this right on. Earlier in the day, I'd been making some pasta, some experiments with gluten-free pasta, and I was using rice flour. I figured, why don't I just dust it with rice flour? It grows on rice, incubate them, and see what I have. So we incubated them. 48 hours later, this is what we had. Fuzzy frickin' scallops. <laughs> they smelled incredible, and Koji smells like a this floral, it's like flowers and honeysuckle, it's incredible. And throw the sweetness of the scallops on there, this smelled fantastic. So now, back to that thought about scallops sitting in your car for two days on a hot summer day, who is gonna eat these? <laughs> what, what were we gonna do with them? Well, we decided to use ourselves as guinea pigs as we often do. Surprised I'm not in the hospital on a weekly basis. That was a joke. Trentina's food is perfectly safe. <laughs> so um, this is what we came up with. We cooked off these scallops, and we have this wonderful dish. This is 
a wild cherry puree uh, with cherries I foraged and a little bit of gremolata on top of the scallop, and it's fantastic. So these proteases and these amylases, they transform the scallop entirely. The outside crisped up nice and crispy, and the inside, the texture of it, it almost cured, it firmed up, and it almost had a texture akin to chicken. And I really hate when everybody compares stuff like, oh, it tastes like chicken. <laughs> but it, it honestly does. <laughs> so I decided, what's the next progression for this? And I'm thinking, well, everybody loves a great dry-aged steak. So I got some eye of round. I decided to culture it. Look at these bad boys. You know, I'm thinking, you know, I had the scallops in there for 48 hours, right? And they developed this wonderful texture. So what if I could create a dry-aged steak, something that normally took 30 days and have it in 72 hours? Like, what would the ramifications be for butchers, for chefs? I mean, this could be instrumental. Well, after 72 hours, this is what we had on that eye of round. And you can see going right down the center of it, this tough silver skin, this really tough piece of, of ligament is just completely broken down. Chef Sawyer cooked them up. The steaks are completely awesome. And they were delicious. So delicious that these items started hitting our tasting menu right away. You know, from there I decided, well, if I can speed up the aging process on a dry age product, something that's meant to be eaten fresh, what would this do for charcuterie? Like I said, you know, charcuterie has mold on it. That's what makes it charcuterie. Same with cheese. So I started going crazy. Koji crazy. And that's crazy with a K. <laughs> so in Italy, they make this fantastic product. It's a whole muscle cut. It is the eye of round, back to that. And it's called brizola. And they cure it for a number of weeks, and then they hang it and air dry it, and it can take a long time. Uh, on average, 60 days, sometimes even longer. Lo and behold, koji is magical, the larder is magical. 60 days into 10 days, and we get products like these. So we have cured pork jaws, we have koji scallops, lamb tenderloin, eye of round, beef tenderloin, pork cheek. We also have, this is copa, if you're not familiar with that. It's great, it's this whole shoulder muscle of the pork, cured, we're able to actually cook it from there too. Another really wonderful thing that we've done is casingless sausage. So take a sausage, this one happened to be llama, llama liver, llama heart, llama kidneys, um, and pork fat. It's not source sausage without pork. Put the koji cure on it, incubate it, and we've got casingless sausages. Um, these, we can use them fresh, we can also use them as charcuterie and let them, let them dry out a little longer. But I think one of the most exciting things that we've discovered with this, this koji process up to date is the koji fried chicken. So for those of you that are gluten intolerant or may have celiac or that sort of thing, this is for you. You can now enjoy fried chicken again. And instead of taking the chicken and dipping it in a flour and then an egg, and even before that, letting it sit overnight in buttermilk to tenderize, I just grow the koji on it. It's instant breading, essentially, on this chicken, and it's fantastic. So, working with koji, seeing how it works, you know, this hasn't been done, as far as our research points, in, in the nearly 2,500 years since koji's been domesticated. You know, I have a hope for the restaurant industry with this. I have a hope that butchers will now be able to rapidly age meat and charge less for them because they don't have to store that meat. I have a hope that this could be an outlet for food deserts. We can create charcuterie using off cuts of meat now, cuts that are normally just thrown away or just turned into less desirable processed foods. And now we have shelf-stable, nutrient-dense proteins for people living in food deserts. I really think the implications of using koji, too, can go much further than that. I think there's applications outside the food industry. You know, the kitchen at Trentina and in the food industry at whole, that's one thing. But I think another thing to look at is, what can others do with it? Are there medical properties to koji? You know, after all, some of our greatest antibiotics came from the observation of mold growing on things and how other molds wouldn't come, in, come near them. Could a farmer use this in bioremediation? 
at the end of the season when there's all these strewn corn stalks and other bits of organic trash on their fields, could koji be sprinkled on, allow all that stuff to break down, and then they have a ready fertilized field to go in the spring, no need to till? What could an engineer do with this? Could the mycelial network of the koji be grown on structures, and can we create biodegradable packaging materials or even construction materials? I think we're just beginning to tap into what koji is and how it can be used. And I think its universe is broad and ever expanding. So hopefully others will be able to take some of this work and be inspired, and we'll see what the universe of Koji has for us. Thank you. Thank you.